Now, like everybody in the room, I come from a massive Celtic supporting family. My uncle Chick, his firstborn was called Kenny, right? Second boy comes along, Danny. Third one, it's a wee girl. What are you going to do, Chick? Clear. After Brian McClear. So could you please welcome him to the stage, Brian McClear. So Brian, welcome to McCool's. Last time I was here was a League Cup final when Kilmarnock beat us 1-0. So I, don't, I hope that's not an omen for tomorrow. Now Brian, uh, you'll be looking around uh, this room and there's obviously a, a big musical influence. Brian is a massive music fan and he joined us last October at the Poetry Club um, where we had live music from Edgar Summertime and we also had Chris McQueer on the stage as well as Brian and Frank, one of your old teammates, Brian. So let's, let's take it back a wee while. This guy here, correct me if I'm wrong, the only Scotsman to sign for three European Cup winning sides. Aston Villa, Celtic, Manchester United. So let's go back to your youth and uh, getting signed up from Aston Villa. Brian, talk to us about that. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say just about a couple of things you said before there is that um, I'm glad that things are going really well with your podcast but if you're going to be involved in video, then I'm not involved because I've got a face for radio. <laughs> uh, the second thing is it's the first time that ever, anyone's ever told a story, which um, I've, I've been assured is correct, uh, that I've been, uh, my name has been used for an actual human being. <laughs> Mainly it's been dogs, cats. <laughs> and, uh, and other uh, animals. Uh, so it's, and it's, I always say that every day is a school day, and the school day for me is that uh, there's a wee girl running about, or probably a big girl running about, absolutely hating me now, you know, because, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I could, could have changed it to Brian, eh, couldn't you? So, uh, but anyway, um, I, I, well, I ended up going to Aston Villa because they were really good to me. The, um, the, the, I'd been down to, uh, for a f number of times on trial. Uh, they asked me if I was interested in uh, going down and uh, because they had said that they would help me to continue with my academic um, studies because my, my parents were always encouraging and discouraging in the sense that they wanted me to play football but they wanted me to get qualified as well and that they they always uh, gave me the encouraging news every week that you could break your leg tomorrow <laughs> and uh, that's your career over. That's what I got from the age of 11 all the way to 35, really. <laughs> uh, but Aston Villa made, the, the, probably the, made me feel the most comfortable and oh. uh, the opportunity to study A-level maths when I was there. Didn't work out quite that way. Uh, but I had, a, I had a good 14 months in Birmingham where I was responsible for Aston Villa winning the league. <laughs> I never played a single game for them, but, but uh, Dennis Mortimer's boots were so clean, so sparkling, he was a captain, that uh, it, it dazzled the opponent's eyes. So that was my claim to Aston Villa winning the, uh, the title. When you were down there, Brian, was there an opportunity at any point for you to get involved in the first team? Were you taken out on away days, etc., to get, give you some experience? Aye, well, there's a few things because um, Aston Villa had a quite had a really good uh, reserve team as well at the time, and the, the manager Ron Saunders always wanted to have practice matches two or three times a week, maybe only for 20 minutes, and he, he always played against the, the kids who were us because he knew that the reserve team players would try and injure the first team players because that was their only chance of getting into the team. So he couldn't, he couldn't afford the reserves to kick shit out of them. And uh, we were too weak to try. We tried to kick them, but we were just too weak, you know. So we played against them all the time. Yeah, Gordon Cowens, um, Dennis Mortimer, Alan Evans, uh, Jimmy Rimmer. 
And uh, Jim Remmer also was used as his fodder after training because there was no goalkeeping coaches in those days. He coached himself. He would get us to um, cross the ball in for him and he'd come and catch and punch and we'd to jump into him when he wanted us to really jump into him. But that also gave him the opportunity when he wanted, he wanted to punch the ball, they would punch you in the ear at the same time. So you learned an awful lot about the, the physical side of the game, that it was, it was going to be tough. Uh, but still very enjoyable. So, yeah, away trips. Uh, I went to Middlesbrough. And at that st those times, there was only one uh, sub. So there was 12 travelled. Uh, the, the, the manager, the coaching staff, a kit man, and me to help out with the kit. Uh, they lost that game 2-1. And the other trip I got, got to go on was incredible for me because... Uh, as a young boy, and my English team was Manchester United, and I went to Old Trafford on a Wednesday night. Funnily enough, it was pissing down the rain, and it was a 3 h game, an incredible experience. But I remember the two events, hoping that one of the players would uh, fall down the stairs or get food poisoning or something like that, so that I would uh, get on the bench as last minute kind of thing, you know. But never happened. <laughs> I had a terrible career, really. You know, so. <laughs> Brian, when, when I speak to people from your era, they do talk fondly of the education that they had within the reserve team because you were up against experienced guys, guys coming back from injury, etc. And you've now got the experience when you worked with uh, uh, the, the SFA of academies and, and until recently there was no reserve league. Did you think that was a massive loss to Scottish football when we'd done away with the reserves and it was youths against youths? I, I think that the, you, you, it's great that... Uh, how much information that young players can get now with how to improve in the practice times and the facilities that are available for them to practice. But when I was taking the reserves at Manchester United, uh, when I was getting phone calls with regards to the players uh, from other clubs who were interested in taking any of those players on loan, the first question they ever asked about any of the players was what are they like get, at playing against men? And when you're going through academy football, you're playing same age all the way through, same age all the way through. And it's one year we had to, to put a team into what was called the Pontins League, which was in the football league. And all their reserve teams were made out of players coming back from injuries or players who couldn't quite get into the first team and a lot of experienced players. I remember going to take a team to uh, Chesterfield and they had a team of um, adults playing, and we had a, a very young team playing. They're a really big, thuggish centre forward who was playing directly against Gerard Piquet. And for the first 25 minutes, he battered Gerard all over the place. Late tackles, elbowing, dark arts, pulling his nipples, all sorts of stuff, you know. And Gerard gave him great kicks, stuck at it, stuck at it. And when the um, centre forward got tired, Gerard does what he does very well now for Barcelona, would take the ball and just run past him and run into midfield and start playing. And I think we beat them 6-1. At the end of the game, the centre half went up to Gerard Piquet, shook his hand and said, well done, son, that was magnificent. Not many people would have, have put up with that kind of abuse. So I apologise for putting you through that. Uh, but it was a great experience for him. And after those games, we had more calls about, can we take this player, can we take that player? Some of whom we were going to let go at the end of the season because the managers who'd been to those games could see that they'd played against men like that big galoot that uh, PK had to overcome. So for me, the, the end of your education in football should be with uh, senior players. I suggested that the Reserve League should have a reserve teams in Scotland Every single one uh, to play in it, you should sign four senior players right at the end of their career. So you might be helping them with their, with their uh, continued coaching aspirations. They may well have always wanted to play for Celtic or Rangers or Aberdeen, Hibs Hearts, Dundee United, but they've never been able to do that. But now they're going to be able to play for the reserves. They're never going to play for the first team. So there will be a goalkeeper, a centre half, a midfield player and maybe a forward and what they do as well is they coach the players for you during the day particularly if you get them that are good pros who have just gone through their life 
trying to do the right thing all the time and didn't just quite been able to do, but give out good information and show good examples. And if needed to be, they could take them somewhere that these young players could lose their virginity. <laughs> Didn't realise there was Not a that I was encouraging any of that, but... <laughs> Are you a big fan of Celtic, Celtic Colts going into the bottom league of the Scottish? I, I've said that's what I've said all along. I think that, 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 that if, for the benefit of football, and I said it in the same in England as well, and they just got shot down by people saying, no, that's not the right quality, not the right quality of pitches, not the right quality of opposition. And some of these were ex players too, and mine is really about the tooth parts. Can they overcome the the physical part of it can overcome different plays, different styles, different hostilities. Uh, and they might need, the these other clubs might need those players mm -hmm. because they're not all going to play at the very highest level. Uh, and it, again, it gives them a, a great chance to be able to say, well, yeah, he played and he played and we can take. There's not enough managers are taking, everybody seems to be wanting a ready-made player to be successful or we just get stick with the senior players, stick with senior players. If you keep doing that, soon there'll be no senior players left and there'll be, there'll be nothing in the, the lower echelons of, of football, particularly in Scotland. You need to give everybody that, you ask any professional football player, and those, when did you when did you play? What, did, what happened? What the circumstances? And nearly every single one of them would be the same thing. Somebody was injured. Somebody was suspended. Somebody was ill. Somebody was out of favour. Or I kicked this player the day before, and the manager of three like I went in and I and I seized the opportunity. If you don't give them that, then you just keep picking on, keep picking older senior players, and they need to keep refreshing it. Let them play. And a lot of the times they surprise you. So those class of 92, they've gone on to be multi-millionaires and hugely successful. After their football careers, some of them surprised you. I trained with David Beckham in the gym and, in, and with the reserves. And uh, for me, all he wanted to do is play what's called a Hollywood pass. He'd get the ball on the right-hand side of the park and he would whiz it 67 yards to the left-hand side of the park towards the left winger who A, couldn't run, B, couldn't control the ball. So it went out, and I used to go, for fuck's sake, what are you doing? And that's just all the time. Now, I couldn't see a player in David Beckham. I thought he was fucking hopeless. <laughs> so they surprised you, right? That was just my view of what I saw at that time. So, but they'll surprise you. Yes, I could see Paul goals. Yes, I could see what, uh, what Nicky Butt had. Uh, David, not if he just kept... And he just used to stand and watch it as well. Watch, oh, I like that. Look, that's a lovely pass, isn't it? <laughs> but this time I'd been running from my own box to that. Although I'd watching, and I, this is fucking nonsense. This. <laughs> just give it to somebody. And so I had, a, I, had a, I had only had one trick when I was playing football. And it used to be that uh, I tried to get the ball and pass it to somebody with the same colour of shirt. <laughs> And then they would move to another part of the field, maybe in another wee space, where they could maybe give me it back. And then I'd try, and by that, we'd try to work my way up towards the goals. And then maybe I'd be there when the ball came in from either side, and the ball, a lot of the times for me, ended up in the goals. Uh, that was sort of, that was my trick. <laughs> and I've tried to teach that trick. How, how it still works now. How did you end up coming to Motherwell then? Um, I don't know. I don't, I, the, great leaving for school at 16, going into a man's world and an adult world where they just treated you as an adult. And uh, right away, although the, right away what happened to me, the guy who wanted me to sign for Aston Villa, uh, he fucked off and went to a better paid job at Leicester. No. <laughs> <laughs> just popped out of my head there as well. Right? <laughs> and that's true, he did. He promised me the world and he fucked off the list. <laughs> so, 
Uh, it became clearly evident the coach didn't like me, and that's what happens sometimes. If he didn't fancy me, he didn't really want me to sign, so I didn't play that often. Um, although when I did play, we we did win my first ever uh, sort of trophy in kind of football post school, and uh, that was a world famous tournament called the Southern Junior Floodlit Cup. <laughs> uh, funnily enough, it was played during the week at night. Um, but we won that. I don't remember much about it, but we won, I know we won that because I've got a photograph somewhere. Uh, and I came back for pre-season training and I'd, I'd applied to go to university just as, just, I don't know, to do something to do. So I filled in the application forms and I got accepted for both Strathclyde and Glasgow. And I don't know how anybody else found out about this because um, not many footballers or football managers in my experience knew what university was. Or could read, you know. So, so I got called in after pre-season. Well, first week of pre-season, I called at Ron Saunders' uh, office on my own. What was I 17, 16, 17? 17, I think I was then. Uh, to be told, uh, you can fuck off to uni. <laughs> no, good morning, whatever. It's just you can go. Yeah, you can fuck off to uni. Um, go and get you pack your bags. And I went back to the digs that day. Packed my bags and I, I got the train back to Scotland. Uh, but I knew that uh, some scout had been a friend, it was a scout at Motherwell. And I went along one day. They were playing at uh, Broomfield in Airdrie in the Lanarkshire Cup. Davy Hay was assistant to Ali McLeod, invited me along to training uh, that Monday because we were playing Airdrie on the Saturday. That Monday I went into training. Uh, on the Monday after training, Ali McLeod said, I want to sign you and play you in the first team tomorrow which was like an incredible thing for me. I'd just been booted out Aston Villa and Ali McLeod wanted to sign me and play me in the team after one training session. I'm not sure if he was the wisest of people, but it was a great boost for me. And so I agreed to sign, not to sign right away because I, I'd said that another friend who was a Celtic uh, scout uh, said, look, just tell them I'm back if they want to have a look or whatever. And uh, the scout, the, the main scout at that time, says, "No, we need to see him. Uh, we need to see him playing or something like that." I said, oh, "I've not. I can't wait for that. This, this is an amazing offer for me. He wants me to play in the first team at Motherwell, part time. It suited me as well because I was going to university. And so I signed for Motherwell. And Alan McLeod was brilliant. He, he, he offered me a certain amount of money. I said, "Well, if you give me that amount of money, um, they'll cut my grant because I was on uh, almost the." the the maximum amount of grant you could get then when they used to give you money to go to get educated rather than get you to pay for it, you know? Which is what I've spent all my money on, by the way, the paying for education. <laughs> but the, the three children seem quite pleased about it, you know? <laughs> yeah. They've all got good jobs. They don't talk to me, but they've all got good jobs. <laughs> so, uh, so David Adam McLeod gave me, uh, he gave, he gave me uh, he gave, to my complete astonishment, he gave me more money. I thought, this is great, that's what well, yeah. So I was like, I was going to university, full grant nearly, and 50 quid a week for playing part-time football. But then Davy Hay took over, and I don't think Davy Hay was, that was his favourite player. I don't know why, but I, uh, I got dropped, and they never lost the game for 20 games. <laughs> so, and then I got back in at the end of that season, scored a couple of goals, and then Davy left f for a better paid job in America. David Hale will come back into the story later on, Brian. But see, when you see went to Motherwell, what was the... He's not coming, is he? <laughs> no, he's not here today. <laughs> who were the experienced guys at Motherwell then who, who maybe oh, helped you along as a young guy? people there. there was, it was a great place to be because I had been involved in being in the dressing rooms as a kind of invisible person at Aston Villa, listening to their banter, because uh, I had to clean the dressing room. It's part of my uh, roles and responsibilities. And being in that dressing room the pre-season that I joined there, uh, you had um, Hugh Sproat, the goalkeeper from uh, Ayrshire. Completely nuts. Completely mad. But Shuggy would be, had this kind of thing where he would swing on the bar when the ball was at the other side of the pitch. Mother would be attacking, he'd turn around and look, and he's got, he's got his legs dangled over the bar, swinging back and forward from it. Kind of entertain himself, you know. Like, 
and they'd get off when the ball came down the other side. But in the, when we got into the, to the Premier League, he would all, he would wear a blue top against Celtic, and he'd wear a green top against Rangers. Completely mental he was. You had uh, Brian McLaughlin, who had been as a Celtic player, terrific football player, great character, taught me a lot about uh, laughing and joking. Alfie Conn, who'd played for both Celtic and Rangers, Scotland, Tottenham. He was another big influence. Joe Walk, who'd been there as the longest serving player, fuller. Full of characters. It was a great place to be. You know, I mean, it's so you could tell right away. I got understood that nothing was irreverent, because we used to have a Church of Scotland minister who would come into the dressing room, and uh, he would uh, come in and get changed in the morning, and they would take the piss at him. You know, like because you know, all he'd do was jog around the pit. So, and they would actually be like hammering him. You know, like for you can't even you know those legs, drain pipes. You know, drink. <laughs> Then he'd join in and all that. I go, he's a minister. He shouldn't be saying things like that. Should he? he didn't actually swear, but they were swearing at him, you know, particularly people like Brian McLaughlin and that. It was, it was a great environment to be involved in. So, great influences for me. So. Brian McLaughlin, for anyone who is unaware of him, and I know there are people in the room who will be well aware of who Brian McLaughlin was, Brian McLaughlin, the first signed by Jock Steen, made his debut for Celtic at 16 and had a horrific knee injury at the age of 18 and apparently was never quite the same after that. So Brian would have played with him when he was a wee bit more experienced. And obviously David Hay was a, a teammate of Brian's when they were at Celtic. But the story that I've heard is that Jock Steen rated Brian McLaughlin as his greatest ever signing. He made his debut before any of the uh, Quality Street kids in terms of age, and probably before any of the Lisbon Lions. I think the youngest Lion was maybe 17. Brian was 16 playing for the Celtic first team. Incredible. By the time you played with him, Brian, could you still see that gift that this, this man had? Yeah, he was a really good player, he just couldn't, he was. He, he didn't have that mobility, and that's why he was He was at Motherwell and not starting for Celtic, but he was a, a very good, gifted, very, very good player, intelligent player, and he was, like I say, he was a really good, and positive influence on on me, if it was for for the banter and the quickness of his, his wit alone. Now, um, David Hay would have been in his early 30s at that point, because he, he retired um, early with a, an eye injury. And um, he took over at Motherwell. Brian, what was it about Davey that he didn't quite fancy you as a player? Or was it just your luck that when you were out the team, Motherwell kept winning? Uh, well, they weren't winning when I was in the team. So he just, I don't know. He, 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 kept, he was right, isn't he? So I don't, I'm, maybe because I was part-time, I don't know. But they, they, he picked a team that went on to a, a 20... 20 league match unbeaten run and Motherwell won the Scottish First Division Championship that year uh, and got promoted to the Premier League. I made enough appearances throughout that to get a, a medal so uh, it it's still ended up as a, a satisfying time for me. I was in, came in for the last I think four games and I managed to score uh, maybe th two or three goals. I remember um, my very first goal in the uh, in senior football was at uh, East Stirling. And East Stirling had always kind of fascinated me as a kid because it was a kind of race between them and Albion Rovers who had the least amount of people that went to watch them. <laughs> you know, it would be like 126, 126 people. And anyway, I ended up playing at um, East Stirling and I, I scored a goal. And then uh, I also remember scoring a goal uh, down at uh, Queen of the South as well, who are uh, celebrating their hundredth hundredth uh, anniversary this month, I believe. So yeah, uh, I think it was uh, it was all downhill from there, really. You know, so after Queen of the South. Now it was Big Billy that signed you for Celtic. How did you hear of the interest, Brian? And you know, we are of a Celtic state of mind. Was that the team for you in terms of Scottish football? Celtic. Aye, yeah, yeah, it was. But my mother wouldn't let me go on the train. She thought it was too dangerous. So I wasn't allowed to go to the games. Um, and my old man was, was working 12-hour uh, shifts, so there wasn't anybody uh, to take me. But I had been to games. I went to see uh, Celtic, a midweek game, playing in uh, the Republic of China a, lot, a number of years ago. And the first game I saw, I think they beat Clyde 5-0. I think Harry Hood scored a hat-trick. You don't need to duck down. There's no, there's no wire there. <laughs> I 
think people can see over you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, this, the, the, I'd, I'd been in Mexico with Scotland for the 19 World Cup, and I'd come back, and um, um, my, my, uh, there'd been a phone call from Jock Wallace, who was the manager of Motherwell, who had also been the manager of Leicester. Uh, yeah, he left Rangers to go to Leicester for more money. <laughs> Fucking hell, Leicester keeps popping up a lot in this conversation. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a, 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 he'd, phoned a, he'd phoned a house. I said, is there a wire there? <laughs> limbo. Is there a limbo dancing to the part of this? The, uh, and there was a phone call and my brother had answered the phone he thought he was me and he'd had a conversation with my brother which my brother couldn't understand the fucking word he'd said <laughs> apart from when he realised it wasn't tell him to fucking phone me so I got the message of the phone the manager so I phone pick up the phone and it takes ages because you had to dial the numbers and wait for it to come back <laughs> even with seven numbers uh, and then he answered the phone right away. Soldier, get your ass over here. Put the phone down. And my mum said, what, what was that? Yeah, oh, he said he sold me. What? He said, sold me, I've got to go over. So I went over and uh, you got to go. I go, where am I going? Soldier to Celtic, Big Billy's waiting for you. You got to go. Aye, what? Just fuck off to Celtic, will you? Forget all this fucking education and malarkey. Fucking load of pish. Just go to Celtic. So, <laughs> Big Billy's waiting for you. So I, I jumped into my um, lime green Morris Marina. I did, that was, that was a car. I had lime green Morris Marina. And I drove to Celtic Park where indeed uh, Big Billy was waiting for me. And uh, Jock could give me a, a piece of advice to say to, to Billy. And so Billy came in and said, look, you want to sign for Celtic, we want to give you a four-year contract, we're going to give you this amount of money a week, and we're going to give you some money to sign. And in the office, uh, the, I think this trick came from Matt Busby, was that Billy obviously was taller than I am, but the seat that he was sitting in was higher above, it was like a bit like a throne, so it's like Hill Caesar kind of thing, so he's sitting in a bigger chair. And I'm sitting one that, that feels as if the legs have been cut off. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, my eyes are like kind of the height of the desk. As I, and he's like, I'm talking to him up there. He's up there and I'm down here. And he had this kind of wee thing, he go, we'll give you, we'll give you £238 a week. I'm like, £238 a week? <sighs> Amazing. I was trying to compute what I could buy right away, £238. <laughs> and we'll give you some money. And I said to him, no, I would, I would like that. And he slunk down into the chair. So he's like, I can see his eyes. I dropped out now. I can see his eyes, my eyes level now. That's how far he slid down in this chair. And he goes, you're a greedy, greedy wee boy. <laughs> I says, where do I sign? So, Bully was there, then he wasn't there, and your old he pal... He didn't go to Leicester, though. He didn't go to Leicester. <laughs> he went well, to unless he did go to Leicester. I no, he went to Man City. He went to City, yeah. Just to cheer up Steve there at the back. No, he, he took City <laughs> down, though, didn't he? The only man to take two teams down in the one season, I think. Villa and City got relegated. That's so half correct or whatever. Bully left, and your old pal, Davey Hay... I know, fucking brilliant. Walked through the door. <laughs> That's, that's <laughs> yeah, I know, somebody that wants me. <laughs> somebody wanted me because he told me he wanted me and he'd given me a contract and then he left. And then somebody that I had the impression that he didn't want me got the job. And also, he, he, he fuck it. When I was second season, Mother O, Jock Wallace, and Jock brought Frank Connor with him. And uh, Jock would shout in my left ear, and Frank would shout in my right ear. I fucking hated the pair of them, you know? <laughs> and I thought, this is brilliant, got away from those two fucking lunatics, right? Well, I thought they were lunatics. What they were doing, they were trying to help me, because at 17, I knew everything. I did it at 17, I did. I know fuck all now, but I did it at 17. 
and uh, they recognised that and they were trying to beat this. I mean, I just resisted and resisted because I was awkward. I'm still awkward, but I was pretty awkward then. And uh, oh, get, get rid of those two fucking brilliant Billy. I didn't know who was with Billy anyway, but does David Hay not come back? And who does he bring? Fucking Frank Connor. <laughs> I think I had, I, I, I think I had like two days of uh, uh, ecstasy of signing for Celtic, four years. I can go back to uni. I think my body will, will decay quicker than my brain. Four years at Celtic. Oh, absolutely brilliant. To, oh, for fuck's sake. What have I done wrong? You started a few games under Davy Hay, though, eh? You I didn't start the first game. I was in the reserves. <laughs> right away. You scored your reserves. first Reserves. <laughs> I didn't tell you that because... We went on a pre-season, pre-season tour to Switzerland and it was really, really, really hot. I mean, it was 90 degrees in the shade. We didn't do a lot of training. We played one of the games against um, Baal, who changed their name quite significantly to Basel. <laughs> See, apparently it was called Baal then. And uh, I got, that's where I got my chocolate from because uh, they had a big uh, um, uh, terrace in it behind one of the goals, roasting the afternoon. There was nobody there. And over the top of the terrace had come two Celtic supporters dressed. And in my, I'm telling you, it's 90 degrees in the shade. They're dressed top to toe in Celtic gear. Tracksuit, coat, scarf, <laughs> hat, blah, blah. Come over this thing, just the two of them there. Switzerland is meant to be cold. On you go, the chocolate McClare. Tommy Bond's like, what was that? <laughs> I said, it was nothing, Tommy. Ah, I think it was. <laughs> no, Tommy, uh, you're all right. Ah, he said chocolate. <laughs> chocolate, ah, it's chocolate, McClare. <laughs> you're having it. <laughs> uh, no, you're all right, Tommy. Ah, I don't give a fuck what you think, you're having it. <laughs> and that was, that was it. So I was like, Tommy Bond's just made sure that that was it because he just kept calling me that all the time and, and re referencing various types of chocolate for the next five or, or, or six days. Came back and I thought I'd done quite well. Played a lot of games, scored some goals. And in those days, which was uh, which, I, which uh, I've always gone against, was that the, the, I think Frank would come in and put up two sheets of paper. And that was the squad for the games. And at that time, the reserves played on the Saturday at 2 o'clock and the first team played at 3 o'clock. So you, you, you're up to the, everybody, even the senior players, Danny McGrain, Tommy Burns, Roy Aitken and that, uh, they'd be up there looking, see if your name's on it and all that, and they'll go like that. And I'm looking, I'm going, Frank, there's a mistake. What is it? I'm not on this one. No. Oh, for fuck's sake, I'm on this one. Reserves, 2 o'clock, uh, report, half past 12 the next day. Anyway, so they went to play Hibs at Easter Road, and I played against Hibs reserves on the Saturday. Scored twice or something. So, so moving to a new club, <coughs> Brian, um, I've spoken to you before because you very helpfully spoke to me about Neely Mocking. Um, Neely being at that stage the, the kit man at Celtic Park. You said that you knew everything. But uh, did you take your own boots to Celtic Park or did you have to be one of these guys that asked Neely for a new pair of boots? No, I had um, a pair of boots, but quite rightly, uh, as the new kid on the block, as, as when people used to go to, to work, certainly when my old man was going to work, the, the first day's work as apprentice, people would send you to the, uh, the, the store and ask for a long stand or a tin of tartan paint. So mine was the kind of t piss taking thing for me was ask Neely for a pair of boots, and I was naive as fuck, right? So, hi, all right, you know. So I was, I, I'd, I'd always, I liked football boots. I'd been, at, I'd been at Aston Villa, and I knew what Puma King were, I knew what Penarol were, I knew what Adidas World Cup were, I knew what the best boots were because I'd cleaned them every day. <laughs> I spat on them, and I polished them, so I knew exactly. And Gordon Count said these amazing. Italian things that were like, oh, they were the best leather ever. But Celtic it was sponsored by um, Adidas. So I'm like, ah, World Cup, 78, magnificent boot. So they'd all prime me, probably Tommy Burns in particular, who was the biggest joker in the dressing room. 
So they're all waiting for Neely to come in to do this. And he's probably in on it as well. Go and ask that young lad that's just saying, we, we, we'll get him, we'll get him. Hi, son, how you doing? Nice to meet you, I'm Neely. And, and I knew he'd played for Celtic. I knew he'd, uh, about the 7-1 and all that. And I knew that he'd been doing. And he said, uh, hi, son, you'll need a pair of boots. I says, I, Mr. Mocking, I would need a pair of boots. What kind of boots do you want, son? I said, uh, I'll, can I, I'll have a do this World Cup. Ho, 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 ho. He's talking to the superstars. What about him? I did this World Cup. He's been here a day. <laughs> What's it you're doing, Danny? Oh, you got to do this World Cup? No. Hi. I'm like, I was about that size. <laughs> I never asked him for a pair of boots after that. But he, the next day he came in and he gave me a pair of uh, uh, Adidas World Cup. So I was uh, the uh, I was humiliated the day before, but it taught me a, a lesson to to not uh, rise above my station right away. So he, it was very valuable from that point of view, and he continued that all the way through. And I, and then I quite enjoyed waiting for the next person who came in that was new to get the same thing. And it didn't matter whether you'd come in from the reserve team dressing room. Mm -hmm. so after the next game, at Dundee, we beat them 6-2, scored four goals. That's right. And then I went away and got dropped. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what, what, what do I have to do? Away, European game away. On the bench. That European away it's would have been test, sport, sport in Lisbon, eh? Would have been uh, European. No, it was our house, I think. Our or, house. Uh, or the... Yeah, I think it was our house, I Dropped or... Yeah, our house, I. You did make your first European start for Celtic against Sport and Lisbon in yeah. the home leg. Yeah. Can anybody name the Sport and Lisbon manager that night? Yes. Oh, I wasn't asking. <laughs> Earlier. 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 Joe Venglos. So you made your start at Celtic Park, two and a half down for the first leg. Aye, two and a half down. It was, uh, it was on the bench in the game in Lisbon, and I'll tell you what, it was one hiding, two nil. I'll tell you, it, was, it could have been in six or seven over there. Aye, and uh, uh, there's no funny <laughs> things that pop in my head all the time. You could just refresh things. We used to go down to well, at the time we'd always go to Sea Mill on the coast to prepare for big games. So it's quite clear that we're going for the European game. And it always used to surprise me, we'd train on the lawn at Seamill, you know, a wee tiny bit of grass. That somebody had spent ages manicuring, yet we were allowed to fucking destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was tiny, you know, and we had like, the whole session on this tiny bit of, with a sea in the background and all that. It's quite an interesting experience, but I remember going up on the bus. Graeme Sinclair, who, who was at Celtic at the time, Graeme hated football, probably still hates football. It was just a, a way of making money and he got out of football as quick as he could to become a news agent and I think he's done quite well at that. But when he was at Celtic, he started up the Footballers Against Football Society. <laughs> of which there was one member. But he bullied Mark Reed into becoming another member. Even though Mark wasn't the, the same view, he just bullied them into it. So the two members, and they would go on about this every day. Footballers against football are here today. <laughs> but I remember on the way up again, that football has been that sort of funny, dark sense of humour. We're on our way up to the bus, and I know, I know I'm playing, and I'm nervous. And uh, um, Sinky comes up and goes, and I'm thinking he's going to be encouraging. He goes, no fucking pressure on you tonight, eh? Glad I'm not playing. <laughs> I was like, eh, thanks, thanks for that, you know. But so not only am I thinking about it, I've got him fucking chomping away in my ear. Hope you fail, you know. I don't want to, I want us to go out because I don't want to be going anywhere else in this competition. I hate being away. I hate football. I don't want to do any more travelling. So <laughs> that was my trip up from, from uh, the Ayrshire coast. And uh, it came out, it was one of those incredible nights, wasn't there? There was, there was 100,000, 39,000 crowd. Well, there was 100,000 people there, but the crowd was 39. <laughs> it's just amazing me that, 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 you know, you know can not get any more people in here? 39, 70,000 capacity. Where did you put the other ones? Where did you fit them in? 39. And uh, it was just an incredible night. 
um, three nil. We wiped out the their two nil deficit early on and three nil at half time, and they they gave up really. They just had, they just really gave they, they gave up. They capitulated and went out to to uh, ended up winning five nil. Uh, and as a as a first experience as a you know, as a starting player in the European tie, I couldn't have chosen a, a better a better event really and a better memory for lots of people. See when you look back there. You know, we Maybe were, not for Graham Sinclair. But. <laughs> we were brought up with, with Celtic. It was a tradition that they would go to see Mill Hydro. I think probably Jockstein started it. Maybe some of the older group could tell me if they'd done it before then. Um, and we did it through your time at the club as well, Brian. Was that really just a means of getting all the married guys away from the wife and the kids, getting people away from uh, guys asking them for tickets? Um, was it that kind of preparation? I think that also yeah. as well was the, it was the saying that, they, look, this is a different game. And then we're going to prepare differently for it, and there's a different mentality about what you're doing. And yeah, it was always, it would always be uh, the case, particularly the ones that they've got um, who have uh, got had kids and maybe could get a bit of a better rest. Although I'm not so sure that applied to David Proven because he had Frank uh, McGarvey as his uh, roommate, and uh, Frank wouldn't fucking shut up. <laughs> I think he talked in his sleep. <laughs> the same garbage he talked when he was awake. <laughs> We're really funny, Frank. I mean, we did a thing saying with Frank, and I'd never, I hadn't been with Frank since he left in '85 or whatever it was. But he used to come out with some things that were hilarious. I don't think he knew they were hilarious, but they were hilarious. And then when we did the the, the event, he was brilliant at it. You know, he was just his stories were. were Really, really good and really funny, you know. But I don't really, didn't, still don't think he realised he was being funny. But it was a highly entertaining free night out for me. So if you ever want to be entertained, he's usually in the Lauriston. <laughs> Showing you videos of the uh, cup final in '85. <laughs> no, I know that because I've seen him doing it. <laughs> We always like to think of ourselves, Brian, as, as a massive club, and we are a massive club. Yeah. You'd been at Villa, who obviously are, are huge. They're, they're a huge fan base down there. You, you'd then gone to Motherwell. When you came to Celtic, did you realise the size of that? I mean, you're obviously, overnight, you become recognised when you're walking down the street. Did you realise that you were at a huge club here, who, at that stage, we still probably had aspirations in the early 80s to do something uh, on a aye, European level? Of course, I And we... And we, we we did reasonably well. You consider it. I mean, we could have gone further in the when we had lost the game to to Forest after having a really good result, nil nil away. But yeah, we had some decent results. Uh, then you also had the experience of of uh, the Rapid Vienna scenario, and uh, I suppose it was the first time you find out that that um, that uh, the Austrians were a bunch of cheating bastards. And that UEFA were full of corrupt bastards, <laughs> and that and then that was evident to me all the way through that that scenario. Also, it gave us a chance to uh, to go into uh, um, a nuclear cloud because we went to Kiev not long after Chernobyl. So that was another <laughs> another uh, at the moment. I haven't grown any other fingers or toes, so. And my children all appear to be quite healthy, you know, none of them have got 11 or 12 fingers and toes. But you look at these things as an incredible, for me, uh, things to do because uh, you uh, were told that it was safe to go to Kiev. Uh, but when we went there and we were talking to people, who, some of the people who could speak English or whatever, they had uh, completely... You know, you get these, everybody, most people, not a lot of people now are, are obsessed with their patios and have got jet washers. Kerchers and all these are being q and you go out for hours and hours and jet wash your patio and the next day it's all green again and then you jet wash it again it's great fun you should get one get a patio first of all <laughs> or you could just go out just go out and just do the pavement outside but uh they had sandblasted they'd done that to the whole city in a kind of huge thing so all the dust that had come out of chernobyl and the rain and all that kind of thing they had washed it all away and I was saying to them, right, well, if it's so safe in this city, where are all the children? Oh, they're in Moscow. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's not fucking safe for them. <laughs> I was only, I, was, I didn't have any children at the time, so I was thinking about 
I might not be able to have any children now. I'm going to be uh, radioactive. Uh, so I tried my best to not go, but I did, we ended up going, and it was a great experience there uh, because it was you, you, you saw how poor these people were and what they were buying and what they were. I mean, there was like there was no there was no plugs for the sink. You had to go to the shop and buy a plug. The little things that we all take for granted, you know. And you go along, and there was a shop. They had a, a, a big cabinet full of different sizes plugs. Which size you want? I don't know. It's a plug. It's like, and it was to save, save the 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 the, uh, the water and everyone else needed to get. And it was a it was a real, um, a real uh, eye-opening scenario when you see all these people queuing for for meat that you wouldn't have given the dog. But there wasn't any dogs in Kiev either, so it didn't really matter. So they'd all been shipped out to Moscow as well. <laughs> <laughs> that Dynamo Kiev team were a crap. Oh, they were shit. They were crap. <laughs> Mikhailichenko, Knutsov. Right. Blocking. Blocking. He was, he was poor, him. <laughs> they had just won the Cup Winners' Cup uh, uh, the year previously, and they were being touted as dark horses for the European Cup that, that season. Celtic, what was the score in the first first game? Was it? I think one each. I think oh, we got. One each. And we were lucky to get away with 3 0 over there. 3 1 over there. Was it Martin McGee scored? Martin McGee got a. Martin McGee. <laughs> stupid things to remember again. Martin McGee got man of the match from whoever the sponsors were in Kiev. And he got a, a samovar, which is a giant kettle. <laughs> No, it's re it was a really lovely thing. I mean, it was like, it, but it was like three foot tall. And we're going, how are you going to get that back? I don't know if it, and he was like, well, we can't really leave it because they might not let us out of the country because we've offended them. So I don't know what he did. He maybe, he maybe, demised, maybe he carried it. He was a giant kettle. <laughs> but probably worth a few quid now. So I'm only asking if he still got it. But the, it was like, um, <coughs> some of them. The story I was told, and I'm sorry to use this guy's name, but Morris Johnston, um, prior to going over to Kiev, Brian, there was obvious risks with regards to diet and, and that kind of thing. And Dr. Fitzsimmons, who was the, the son of the old doc, had uh, been going around the rooms checking on the players maybe the night before the game. And it comes to Mo Johns, he wasn't your roommate, was he? Uh, I, 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 I'm... I roomed with Morris once when I was in Scotland under 21s, but we were both at different clubs at the time, so right. he uh, couldn't understand. Because I was at uni there, so he must have been at Motherwell, yeah. So I was I was studying for some statistics or maths exam, and, and he was like completely befuddled, <laughs> befuddled. That, that anybody outside primary school had a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes us on nicely to the story. So the Celtic players had been advised about diet, etc., and Dr. Fitzsimmons goes into Morris Johnston's room where he's got a suitcase on the bed. And he says to him, do you want any water pills? You want this, you want that? No, it's fine, I brought my own food. And he opened the suitcase that was full of Mars bars. Morris Johnston, and because he was told not to eat when you're in Kiev, so he took a suitcase full of Mars bars to Kiev with him. That's how thick he was. So w when you think back to Morris... I think uh, he, well, I don't remember ever getting a Mars bar. <laughs> So I think he was a greedy bastard then. <laughs> Carrying a whole suitcase of Mars bars all the way there. Not, that's a terrible thing to do. He didn't go to Leicester, did he? <laughs> oh, worse. <laughs> Wait, when, when fans look back to that time, Brian, Morris Johnson seemed to, at that time, he was idolised. He was a fan's favourite. But anybody that watched the game thought, well, actually, Brian McClure's doing all the work and scoring more goals. Was that something that bothered you? Were you even aware of it? No, because my whole idea of playing football was to go along, play the game, enjoy the game, enjoy the support, and jump on the bus and get the bus back. That was that was my. I had no kind of thing about like I needed to be um, loved because I've always the, that's, the view for me is quite simple. People work hard uh, to earn enough money to go to football games. Still do now, paying a hell of a lot more money now to go and watch it. And if they want to shout and scream and, and, uh, and, or, or sing and laugh and joke, then they should be allowed to do that because my feeling is that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that uh, I would much rather be on that green bit than be where you are. So that's how I've kind of so 
please just vent your spleen at me because I'm quite happy to be here. And then Mo was a th different type of person, different type of character, you know, he was he was single. I was married, I had a, a young child, so um, he was he was a decent enough lad and all that kind of thing, although he never used to have a bath. Well, I, that that I don't know if it's bizarre or not, but noticing things, you know. So I can tell when I go into the pub in Glasgow, who's a Celtic supporter, who's a Rangers supporter. <laughs> I can tell. All Celtic fans wear green training shoes. <laughs> All the Rangers supposed to wear red, white and blue ones. And you can tell I was in the pub last year watching the Celtic Rangers game and I said to Fred, he's a Rangers supporter, he's a Celtic supporter. What? No. Celtic scored, sure enough. Celtic scored. Yes, she had beauty. Oh, for fuck's sake, Rangers. <laughs> Red, white, and blue training shoes, and cream training shoes. You can tell. Although I thought it sounds quite bizarre. Or, I mean, I was walking along the road. I was coming here this morning, and big game tomorrow. Big local derby, old firm game. Everybody's up for it. There's three people walking towards me: a granny, a mother, and a, a daughter, and they're dressed head to toe in Rangers kit, all different Rangers kit. What are you doing? Do you not know the game tomorrow? Top to toe. That's that, not that normal in Glasgow, I don't know. It's normal or not, you know. I was going to stop and ask them, but I thought they'd headbutt me. <laughs> in the end of your first season at Celtic, um, we went to the cup final against what was probably a vintage of Aberdeen side, and we weren't lucky to lose the cup final. No, we weren't unlucky. It was Roy Aitken's fault. <laughs> I was going to get you that. And it was Roy Aitken's fault in the League Cup final. So it was, it was unlucky that Roy Aitken was playing. <laughs> <laughs> and those two games for me, I know he did many great, other great games for Celtic <laughs> and won many things. Uh, but for me, it, it was Roy's fault. Was the referee not to blame for the 3-2-1 against Rangers in the League Cup final? Uh, well, the referee did it in his best of days, did he? Really? Mm. You know, you like sending somebody off and then telling them to come back up and then sending off somebody else. And then uh, it was a bit, I don't know, it was a bit. Uh, yeah, the Aberdeen game, they were, uh, they were much better than us. And Cup finals, you always get a chance to win. In. Uh, arguably, in, in the 85, Dundee United could have been the best team and put in the best performance. But Celtic scored two goals to win the game 2 1, you know. so. During your time at Celtic, we struggled against Dundee United. They always seem to be able to get a result against us. I remember struggling against Hamilton, never mind Dundee United. <laughs> Sometimes it was just like Dundee United at home, in particular with with Jim McLean, but a formidable team at home. Yeah. Now, at but they struggled time, against them in 1967 as well, didn't they? Aye, they did. Aye. At that time, obviously. Lost twice. Home and away. Yeah. Aye, I know some fish. No? <laughs> <laughs> Ferguson was coming through as, as uh, a, a kind of emerging manager at that stage at Aberdeen, and he played a big part in your career later on. Did you ever have any kind of dealings with Ferguson at that time? Was he ever interested in you as a player when he was at Aberdeen? I don't know. I'd, I'd, um, I had an eventful event. Uh, because I'd um, scored a few goals and being top goal scorer they used to um, invite the top league scorer in each country in Europe to the Adidas Golden Boot Awards the first year I went to Paris and they had a and Adidas they didn't scrimp they put on a great party and uh, we went to the um, Folie Berger and it was like incredible for me I was like Paris this amazing show semi-naked women no no that wasn't important that part <laughs> Uh, and then they, we got kicked out because we have two shows a day. So we were there in the afternoon, got kicked out, and then that was it, finished. But I just wandered up and down the Seine, as you do, because I didn't have any money. So, and then the next time I went, it was in um, the Principality of Monaco. So as soon as that, uh, so I don't know whether I was driven as part of this idea that it was going to be there to start and score more goals. I don't think it was a greedy player, but I did end up getting the chance, so I was top goal scorer, going to go to, to uh, Monte Carlo, Monaco, and all I can think about was James Bond, James Bond films and other films of that ilk in the casino in Monte Carlo, and I've got a hundred pounds, and I'm going to go to the casino, hundred pounds red, 
hundred pound red. I've just got this in my head. That's all I'm going for. I've got hundred pound in my pocket. After the two, I'm going to walk in. Billy, big bollocks, hundred pound on red. Win, lose. I'm going to take it. And then I'm going to go back to the hotel. Again, an incredible event. Got lots of nice gifts from Adidas. And uh, it's uh, the casino's sit across the road, so I can see the casino. And of course, hundred pound red, hundred pound red, hundred pound red. <sighs> Brilliant, what a story to tell, even if I never play football ever again, we've got, yeah, James Bond, shaken, not stirred, £100 red. And as I come out, uh, oh, the, before that, sorry, I'd, I'd just managed to catch the plane from Manchester to Nice, and Alex Ferguson was on the plane with a load of prominent English journalists. Got to the hotel, lovely hotel, and they said, what are you doing? I don't have any plans. Come down for lunch with us. So I went down and had lunch, and they said, would you like a drink? And I said, well, I don't know. And they were drinking bottles of Bex, and I don't think I'd ever seen a bottle of beer before. It was just tenants, I thought that was all there was. <laughs> or McCune's, and it came out of this thing at the back of the bar. Bottles, never seen them, apart from American films. So I said, I'll have a bottle of that. They were drinking bottle of, they were drinking Bex, for enough, fine. Huh? And uh, he comes down, Fergie, never met him before, sits down, and he's, he goes, do you know what I hate about football players? I was like, no idea. Fucking that. <laughs> Just as, I, as he says, fucking that, I go, all right. Put it back down. I thought, you're not my manager. And uh, that was my first experience. So I had a few more becks. He was drinking Campari and soda. Because he thought this was, he didn't really, wasn't a drinker then, he says, so he drank Campari and soda. It was one of the most disgusting, I tried it once, oh God, it's disgusting. Makes butt fast look like a cocktail. <laughs> so anyway, at the end of the event, he goes, where are you going? I'm going 100 pound red. What? Casino. Dunk my bags, dunk my, and what they gave us as well. I got a money clip. A Gucci money clip was one of the prizes. That was straight on the 100 quid. I've got a Gucci money clip, and I said I've got 100 pound. I think the money clip was worth more than 100 quid, but I think this is brilliant, this. I've got, I can take it out of this money clip, it's even classier. Take out my pocket, money clip, what? 100 pound red. I've got all this played out in my head. Where are you going, casino, 100 pound red? No, you're not. Eh? Man, who the fuck are you? You're not my manager. You're no going. Right, very good. So went back to the hotel, went up to the room, got the same thing. Ready, I'm ready to go, look in the mirror. Hundred pound red. And I went to bed. No, I went to the casino. Went to bed. Compound and I had no idea why I went to bed, because he wasn't my manager. I kept saying, He's not my manager, not my manager, but I went to bed. And then that was compounded by the fact the next day I found out that he'd gone to the casino. Had a fucking <laughs> And I had a fucking great time. <laughs> I didn't have a book, I didn't have a comic, I didn't have any music, I just sat there like that. I'm in Monte Carlo in a hotel room, looking up at the ceiling thinking, what the fuck are you doing? And I said in bed, and I told that story at his 25th anniversary dinner, and I said to him, if I hadn't gone to bed, I wouldn't be here, would I? He went, no. So it was a test for me, even although that I wasn't he's one of his players. I think that if I had gone to the casino, I'd, I wouldn't have, he would never have signed me at my United. So was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? Probably a bad thing. I should have went to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> Still got the money clip? I have, I somehow, I. I haven't got the £100 nor gear. <laughs> that was my next question. I bought, I bought, nappi no, I bought, I bought nappies with that when I got back. They were more important than the hundred quid red, but it's interesting though that he was he was testing you, even though you weren't his player. He might he might have fancied you at that time, Brian. But um, before you left Celtic after the eighty five cup final, we had a memorable season that uh, ended at Loftus. They're still not a trip, were they? <laughs> <laughs> it ended they can they can edit that out. She's amazing at editing. She made me look good and intelligent in the last time I was doing some filming in Glasgow. <laughs> Hey, what's your asthma? <laughs> <laughs> Have you got your puffer? 
Love Street 86, Brian. Um, it's one of the moments as a Celtic fan you look back on is almost fairy tale like we were never going to win that. What, what, what's the, the team talk at Love Street that day from Davy Hay? You, you all know what you need to do, but I mean, how or are you looking at guys like Tommy Burns, Danny McGray, and Roy Aiken? No, I think that the fact that we had gone on a, a, a winning run. So for me, the, 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 the time that I thought, well, we've got a right good chance was we went to Patology and beat Aberdeen 1 0. The, uh, the other dick guy you're talking about, he scored the winning goal. And we'd never, again, like talking about Dundee United, we'd never, we never really did that great at Petodre either, you know. So that, that for me, winning there was like, wow, I think we've got a, we could kind of do this now. And then I think that Hearts drew a game, which then left it going down to the last game of the season, where we had to win by two clear goals and they just had to lose. And we were like, well, we've got, again, we we're just going to go into the game and just play. And we were really confident because we'd been playing really well. So and David Hay was, was, was a man of, of very, very few words. So he probably just named the team and said, uh, uh, it's up to you now. That would have been it. And uh, we were confident enough that, we'd, that we were... And we knew that there was going to be a great support. Because you got it for warm-up and it's, it's, it's heaving already. Um, and we say we were we were pretty buoyant, and and we you just had that feeling that that uh, it was going to be tough for Dundee because people don't remember at the time that Dundee would had a chance to qualify for Europe that year, so they had something to play for as well. It wasn't just a dead rubber for them. It certainly wasn't for Albert Kidd, was it? Being a Celtic fan, you know. So I wish I could get one of those T-shirts so that they all printed for the Hearts thing. I that'd be good. <laughs> what was your what was your thought when at Love Street that day the Celtic end went mental after Jim, what was it, Dun, this one goalkeeper named Jim Kennedy? Jim Stewart, Jim Stewart, who had played for Rangers, had the ball in his hands and it erupts behind the goals and then all down the side. And he's like, I've never been applauded or cheered <laughs> for catching the ball before. Uh, and he was completely bemused. I've, I've, I've met Jim Susskind, he's a cracking guy. Uh, he didn't completely be amused, and, and then it was, it was it had a, it was a little bit murmur first, and then it was a proper cheer, and then it was like yeah, that. Uh, um, well, the first of all, it was that the, the, the message come through that Kit had scored, and uh, Walter Kid played for Hearts at the time as a red right back, so there was like there was a bit of, there was a oh, fuck Hearts have scored that's it with bollocks right because we were winning four or five nil by then, uh, so we'd done the job. Uh, and then it was kid through that it was Dundee forward Albert kid, and it was a so I think I think that was con uh, that made it even better for this, for everyone that oh, and then an incredible euphoria and then a, f a few uh, a few minutes later he he he, um, he managed to score a second and that was unfortunately for Hearts that that just pummeled them and they lost the cup final the following week to Aberdeen. You're talking about, I'll go back to Love Street just now, but I read, a, I heard a story about uh, Fergie again when Aberdeen were playing Hearts in that 86 Cup final. And it came from John Robertson, actually. And Robertson says that Alec MacDonald had told them during the week, forget about it, we're going to win the Cup. It'll still be a great season if we win the Cup. Forget about last week's gone, eh? As they turned up to Hamden, Ferguson had all the Aberdeen team there to meet them. And the Aberdeen team would go, that, oh, sorry about last week, boys. And, and Robertson says, we were beat as soon as all the Aberdeen players started talking to us. And then they'd fired last week back into the reeds. <laughs> uh, it wasn't bad at psychology. <laughs> See, that's the thing. That, that there's loads of people now getting paid a lot of money as actually psychologists in football. But the best psychologists were the pavement psychologists that learned on the pavement, Steen, Shankly. Ferguson, Smith, those types of people that, that use their own experiences to to cajole you and kid you on and sometimes kick you in the arse when you needed it to get performances out. And we're masters at it, absolutely brilliant at it. You know? um, and Frank McGarvey responded to comments about St. John, uh, St. Mirren selling the jerseys that day by saying that uh, there was no way they would have done that. But the champagne could have been better than the Celtic changing room after the game. <laughs> now, now, after that, Brian, Kevin's going to ask you regarding um, strengthening. Celtic should have strengthened. They should have strengthened that team and moved on. 
and obviously into your final season at Celtic. Well, we should have done it in the January or, or towards the end because we would, we had a lead over Rangers, or Graham Sinus's Rangers, and they managed to claw it back, or we believe like, we managed to dick it off whatever way around you want to look at it, and they should have signed a player then because that's what normally people give everybody a, a boost. So um, Alex Ferguson signs or or through set circumstances. Uh, Cantona and uh, we needed I think we needed a player um, Eric wasn't available so it had to be somebody else uh, to, to come in just to give everybody a wee and a, a bit of freshness about it and the board the board wouldn't back him because the day they told, they told us oh, I would tell Danny or tell somebody so that we were aware that look and that was, a, that was obviously a kind of kicking the balls for everybody uh, because I think all of us have been used to that kind of way that it worked and if somebody came in to take your place it was a challenge then for you to uh, to step up again to, to whatever you know we were five points clear in january uh, and thanks for me uh, <laughs> davy hay can we talk about someone else <laughs> davy hay wanted to sign um the boy mclaughlin for chelsea though he also wanted to sign pat nevin for chelsea he wanted to sign steve clark St. Murn, and he also wanted to sign a young guy at Norwich called Steve Brutz. Well, well he's obviously had a good scouting network then, if he was looking to those particular ones. So. What actually happened is, when we went to the February, we played Aberdeen uh, three times in the Scottish Cup, and we ended up playing five games in 14 days. Do you think if they boys would have came in, it would have helped us Aye. definitely? Yeah, of course, yeah, because they were very good players, and um, you needed to have a number of players to, be able to play those games. It's just unfortunate that, although they were in quite, quite tremendously exciting uh, cup ties against Aberdeen, the, 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 we had to go and play. That's one thing you must say that the free the free cup tie replays. Eh? I mean, we played them at Aberdeen on a Sunday, then we took them to Celtic Park on the Wednesday night. There was seemingly like fifty five thousand there that Wednesday night. I'm sure there was probably more. Then we played them at Dens Park on a Monday night. You scored the winner in that, that game, eh? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Dundee, Dundee Aberdeen wet, windy. I know we won because we went through, but I don't. Can't remember. Your contract was running down towards the end of that season. Uh, obviously, Davy Hay left at the end of that season. Were you? Ever offered an art contract? Were you, were you wanting to stay or? No, no, I got offered a contract, but um, and David has suspended all negotiations with players, uh, Murdo, Alan McAnally, uh, myself, because they made it clear that uh, that Morris was the priority, and they were talking to him and his representatives all the time. He was a priority, and that was made perfectly clear. And that was probably another thing that probably it would affected the team. Because quite rightly, you wanted to be felt of value. They had they had made an offer, uh, but it was well short of what um, to all of us. I think the similar kind of offer, but it was well short of what uh, Morris's offer was. So it did probably be a cause that not so much Davy, because I think that it was down to the board that. And uh, the day that David David came to my house, and I hadn't still had made up my mind. And he went back to Celtic Park and told them they'd had a good conversation with me and they sacked him. And Billy McNeil was around, sitting around the corner. So that's what happened with it. that. He was in, he, there was still a good chance. But, and then I had to chat with, uh, with Billy and uh, Jack McGinn and, that, and what they'd said wasn't the same as Davey had said. So uh, I, I felt that that wasn't, that wasn't going to suit me. That, that kind of tipped me to to go, you know. Um. In the second half, we'll speak to Brian about his Manchester United career. Um, but in the interim, we're going to ask Kevin Miles back on at the stage to give us a rendition of some of his favourite uh, Celtic tracks. Can I please remind you, thanks all for your attention uh, so far. It's been intriguing speaking to Brian here. But um, please download the Fans Bet app, choose a Celtic state of mind, and go over to the merchandise desk where we'll be taking names to put you in the draw for the free raffle for the signed framed Celtic strip. So please put your hands together for Brian McClure.